All right. Uh, welcome to all Harvard faculty, uh, students, members of the Harvard athletic community, and other viewers in attendance uh, to this Valiant Voices and Vision webinar. My name is Isaiah Wingfield, a senior football player at the college studying economics. I also serve as the chair of the Harvard Athletic Black Varsity Association. And my name is Chelsea Williams. I'm a junior at the college studying economics. I am currently the captain of Harvard Women's Tennis Team, and I'm a chair of Harvard Athletics Black Varsity Association. Harvard Athletics Black Varsity Association is an inclusive organization partnered with Harvard Athletics to enhance the Black student athlete experience. Through educational opportunities, community service, advancing social initiatives, and creating lasting connections with the Harvard community and beyond. This group was formed to ensure Black student athletes on campus feel welcome, supported, and heard. Before we get started with the webinar, we will hear from our John D. Nichols, class of 53, family director of Harvard Athletics, Aaron McDermott. Thank you, Isaiah, and hello, everyone. We are all excited to welcome you to this first event in a series created by the Harvard Athletics Black Varsity Association. I am honored to join this group in welcoming our Crimson panelists and my friend, Elsie Granderson, in moderating this conversation. I am so grateful they could all be with us today and to the BVA for bringing us together. I'm sure we were in for a treat, so enjoy and thank you for being with us. All right, thank you, Aaron, for the warm welcome, the introduction, uh, and all the work you've done thus far uh, for Harvard Athletics. Today, our wonderful panel of Black Harvard alumni and former varsity athletes will discuss race and sport, how they found their voices, and creating systemic change in 2021. First, we have Coma Gandhi Fishbein, class of 1995. Coma is currently the Vice President of Curriculum at Code Academy, a leader and innovator in educational technology. Prior to joining Code Academy, Coma was an Executive Director at Morgan Stanley. Before joining Morgan Stanley, Coma was a Senior Manager in the Advisory Services Practice of Ernst & Young. Coma participated at the Naval ROTC program and commissioned as an SN in the US Navy after graduation from Harvard. Coma was part of the early groups of female officers in the Navy to serve on combatant ships after the Navy lifted the moratorium, excluding women from those roles. Coma served as a service warfare officer and attained the ranked Lieutenant Commander. During her athletic career, Coma was a member of the Harvard Varsity Women's Soccer Team for two years and finished her athletic career at Harvard as part of the Radcliffe Rugby Football Club, now Harvard's Women's Varsity Rugby. Coma's 20-year rugby Playing career includes rugby at the top clubs and domestic elite levels. Coma's coaching background includes coaching in the USA Women's Club Sevens National Championship Series with one top 10 national finish. Coma currently serves as the first women's head coach of the US Navy Men's Sevens Rugby Program. Coma is also part of coaching of Roots Rugby, a program that seeks to provide opportunities for rugby athletes of color to enter and compete in high level domestic and international tournaments. Coma holds a, B a BA from Harvard University and an MBA from the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. Lastly, Coma was elected Chief Marshal of, Har of the Harvard class in 1995 for their 25th uh, reunion. Thank you for your contributions and for being here with us today, Coma. Next, we have James Blake. James Blake is a former professional tennis player that had a career high singles ranking of number four in the world and a career high doubles ranking of 31 in the world. James is currently a television analyst on the Tennis Channel, ESPN, and CNN. He is a published author and co-authored the book that reached number 15 on the New York Times bestseller list, titled Breaking Back, How I Lost Everything and Won My Life Back. James founded Thomas Blake Senior Memorial Research Fund to support cancer research at Memorial Sloan Kettering and the James Blake Foundation. While at Harvard, James is a member of the men's tennis team, where he aided in two Ivy League titles in 1998 and 1999. He earned varsity letters and was an All-American in singles in 1998 and 1999, and in doubles in 1999. After two years at the college, James turned pro and went on to compete in numerous Grand Slams and Olympic Games, while gaining recognition as an outstanding competitive athlete. James is a recipient of a number of awards, including the Arthur Ashe Humanitarian of the Year in 2008. Next, we have Christopher Eggie, class of 2018.
Christopher E. Eggie is an associate at Goldman Sachs, where he is an investor for the firm's growth equity investing desk and ambassador for their launch with GS effort, a $500 million commitment by the firm to invest in women and minority founders. Chris is also a member of the founding team for the grassroots community organization, No More Names, whose mission is to create awareness and inspire action amongst youth with respect to police violence and faults in the criminal justice system. He graduated Magna Cum Laude with honors from Harvard University in 2018 with a Bachelor of, Art, of, of Arts, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics and a secondary degree in African and African American studies. While at Harvard, Chris is a member of the men's basketball team who, helped, who, who he helped win two Ivy League championships in 2015 and as a captain in 2018. In 2018, Chris also had the honor to serve as the undergraduate English orator at Harvard College commencement ceremony. I will say uh, just being on campus with Chris at the time, uh, we all felt his impact uh, and his impact is still being felt uh, even after he's graduated. So thank you, Chris, for being here. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Next, we have Gabby Thomas, class of 19. Gabby Thomas is a current New Balance professional track and field athlete. While at Harvard, Gabby earned several first team All-American and all Ivy League first team honors. Perhaps Gabby's greatest collegiate accomplishment would be breaking the NCAA indoor 200 meter record during her 2018 season. It would be the following fall that she would sign with New Balance and become a professional athlete. Very recently, Gabby ran the number two all time fastest American 300 meter indoor time, which also ranks as seventh fastest time in the world to date. While at Harvard, Gabby held positions as the Director of Diversity for the Harvard Undergraduate Woman in Business Organization, Vice President for the Women Everywhere Believe Harvard Chapter Program, and Track and Field Captain during her sophomore and junior years at the college. Gabby is currently obtaining her MPH at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health, working as a Public Affairs Associate for Sedidaire, all whilst training for the up and coming Summer Olympic Games. And last, but certainly not least, our moderator, LZ Granderson, uh, a current sports and culture columnist for the Los Angeles Times and radio show co-host on ESPN on 710 AM in Los Angeles. Since graduating from Western Michigan University in 1996, LZ has appeared on The Zone, CNN, ESPN, and ABC, uh, has written numerous outlets um, including ESPN, The Undefeated, and the Atlanta uh, Journal-Constitution, uh, and has even joined Marvel Studios' digital team, co-anchoring the red carpet coverage of the world premiere of the Avengers Infinity War. Uh, throughout his career, LZ served as a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago, uh, the Hessinger Institute at Columbia University. Um, he taught sports journalism at Northwestern University, um, and his TED Talk, uh, which is amazing, everybody should go watch it, um, has more than 1.5 million views and has been translated into 26 uh, different languages. In 2016, LZ was inducted into the National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association Hall of Fame. Uh, I personally have been watching LZ on numerous platforms throughout my life, uh, so I'm incredibly thankful to have him moderating this event. Um, and with that, I will pass the program over to, uh, to LZ Branderson. Thank you much, Isaiah. What a really nice introduction, not just for myself, but for everyone. Um, I just sat back and was just finding myself thinking, wow, just listen to all this um, Black excellence. You know, it's, um, it's really, really beautiful to see. And that's my dog, Rufus, uh, that you probably are hearing right now in the background. Um, he's the chocolate lab, so he's also of color. He can participate as well. Um, but I would try to keep him to stay quiet for as much as possible. Rufus! The joys of... Uh, working from home. Um, my first question for the panel really is open to everyone. Um, my own personal experience, I felt the world changed during the protests for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in a variety of ways, both good and bad. And I'm just curious um, for our panel did you sense a shift in the country um, in the months that have, that have transpired since George Floyd's murder? And if so, what exactly has that shift been to witness or to experience? I guess we can, let's start with Chris. 
because uh, he's also going to tell me that the Lakers are going to repeat because he's a very intelligent basketball player who does not want to disappoint us. The Lakers will repeat. The Lakers there will repeat. Go. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> but in terms of how the world sh shifted um, since the events of this summer, I would say that the willingness to have a dialogue, I think, has really emerged in the, in the aftermath of the events. I, I think, you know, for example, with the organization that I run, No More Names, um, we've, we've been constantly discussing issues of police brutality since, you know, we founded the organization in 2018 and trying to have conversation with a variety of organizations, individuals, and just bring awareness to the issue and start dialogues. And the amount of, you know, people who were, you know, who would say we don't want to talk about that issue or, you know, uh, weren't even really aware of it being an issue, particularly, you know, people from white America, people who weren't black, uh, was substantial. And it was like a major headwind that we faced in terms of trying to trying to spur forward a dialogue. And in the aftermath of the events of this summer where, you know, we lost, you know, many beautiful black souls, George Floyd and Brianna, you know, being amongst the names. Um, I thought that we saw some positive momentum in terms of people now being like, oh, wow. You know, and it's almost like their eyes open for the first time when we've been shouting this for years upon years. And there's a list of names that, you know, so many young black kids have had to learn, you know, in, in, their, in their adolescence that, uh, that I feel like people kind of ignored. And I feel like this moment kind of led to a opening of the eyes that led to a lot more people being aware and willing to have that, at least have the initial discussion. And I think that's important. Um, what I don't think has happened yet, and I hope it will, is like a permanent shift, right? Where I feel like it's a momentum that isn't temporarily gained, but something that people are willing to actually commit the, commit themselves to the work to, to do. Um, I, I, I worry that, you know, in the aftermath of the events, you know, we kind of had a summer where everybody was making statements, everybody was trying to get involved, everybody was trying to do the work. I worry that, you know, some of that momentum is lost and I hope that we can continue to, to take efforts to make sure that people continue to do the work, um, even when, even though it's not the, the top headline right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kind of piggyback on that. I, I agree so much, Chris. And I, I had, um, I had uh, an experience with the police in 2015 and, you know, it made it so that I was shouting about it for years, um, Colin Kaepernick was kneeling about it. And I feel like the difference when George, when this happened to George Floyd was, uh, was, was a few, a few parts of it. One is that it was so graphic. It was so in your face with how brutal, um, it could be to be watching on the news, a murder take place and at the hands of the police and in such a nonchalant manner, um, that they were almost uncaring about uh, a human life being taken over a counterfeit $20 bill. And I think that, uh, awaken people. I feel like my incident awakened the people that were in my circle, the friends of mine that couldn't believe that this could happen to me, the the friends of mine that maybe didn't see me as someone that could be harmed by this kind of behavior, that I wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time or things like that. Um, but this opened the eyes, I feel like, of, of America and especially white America, because I think they, uh, as Chris said, they, they want to a lot of times brush us under the rug. They didn't see this in their in their day-to-day -day life, so they didn't need to be um harassed about it they didn't need to think about it and now this was forcing them into it so when you see the protests going on and when you see that they're 50 percent of them are white when i was i live in san diego and it's a very, it's a community that is largely white um some latino and then uh to see the 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 mixture the the very the variety when you go to those protests and it's not just the the black community that's screaming about this issue i think that's what made this have some legs and have uh, and make a difference but I agree with Chris that it, it's it's losing it's losing steam, and um, I don't know if everyone is committed to doing the work, to actually holding police accountable, uh, to making uh, each police department accountable for for their officers uh, on a day to day basis. And I am still encouraged that it's that it's lasted this long because I was very um, I was on a bit of a roller coaster when it happened, thinking it was going to be another one of those things. It's a one cycle story, and I'm, I was encouraged the fact that it actually had a lot of staying power, but I, I do hope it continues and the momentum shifts, uh, continue staying in the right direction. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think one of my concerns moving forward is the momentum that we did have. And I think it now kind of falls on a lot of us as black people to continue that. And that stress and that load um, of making sure and holding our white allies accountable. Um, 
for you know their own privilege and you know their racial ignorance i think that kind of thing is, is going to fall on us and it's going to continue to fall on us um and that's you know that's a responsibility that's kind of a lot that's a lot for us to take on um and i will admit that you know i've had a lot of uncomfortable and crucial conversations um with a lot of people that wanted to be allies and who wanted to address their racial ignorance um and combat the social inequality but uh I think moving forward, I, I think it's it's a little bit worrisome to see the the momentum fall off a little bit. Um, but I think you know now we're just gonna have to hold ourselves and themselves accountable to to make sure that we're making a lasting change moving forward. Yeah, I would agree. It's shifted, especially the types of conversations that are happening because. Now, I can understand that sometimes when an incident happens far away from you, it's easy to say, well, I understand why it happened in that context, but my goodness, it could not have happened to you because the way that you are sort of positioned in people's lives is as an isolated individual, not a member of a larger community. And I know that it has fostered a lot of very honest and uncomfortable conversations about who I am, how I am being seen, and what my relationship is with different types of people such that you know, to everyone's point, it, it can't just be an isolated thing that we watch on YouTube or that we watch on television and then we go back to our homes and we don't do that work. We don't push those conversations because otherwise that lasting change that we need to see happen among our various constituencies and communities will just die out. And that's something that we can't afford to let happen. That this is something that it's a pivotal space, I think, in our history and in our racial identity as a nation where we don't have the luxury of being able to put that back on the shelf. It's with us and we need to carry it forward and be committed to continuing those conversations, however uncomfortable or uh, difficult they may be. Now, I'm fascinated with this conversation about uncomfortable conversations. Uh, my best friend uh, is from Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I'd known his family for years. And so when Jacob Blake happened, you know, we've had some very uncomfortable conversations. Um, I'm very curious as to, as you think about your time on campus, do you feel that the campus was receptive to these conversations you were trying to have pre-George Floyd? Or did Harvard specifically need a George Floyd to open his ears to the capacity in which they're open now? Again, that could be, you know, Oma, Gabby, anyone. <laughs> Yeah, I think it facilitated the conversation and it opened the door because I think that when you're in a context where perhaps you're seen as one particular dimension, that you're an athlete or you're my friend or you know, those, it, it doesn't necessarily represent the intersectionality of your lived experience. And these are conversations that are now taking place where perhaps somebody didn't want to ask a question about, well, how did you feel when you were on campus? Or did you feel like you were accepted? Or did you feel like you could bring your whole self to your athletic team, to whatever community that you were part of? And I think it has forced some of these conversations. It's been a long time since I've been on campus, but having remained involved with the Harvard athletic community, it has facilitated conversations that I have never had, where we're actually talking about what it is like to be part of a community of color on a campus, what it is like to be an athlete of color on a campus, and what does that mean for the overall health and well-being of that athlete and for their contributions to the team that they're a part of. So um, I, it, it seems like it has changed the conversation such that those topics that might've been discussed on the back of the bus on the way to a game or perhaps at an alumni event are now actually part of that conversation about what it means to be an athlete and what it means to be an athlete at Harvard. Yeah, and I'm, I'm uh, equally uh, further away from my time at Harvard, so I'm interested to hear what the, the two most recent uh, graduates have to say. But for me, um, you know, you just, as you said, Elsie, there's impressive introductions here, and I feel like that's, that's Harvard in general, is it, it can be intimidating. Um, so having an organization like this, like the Black Varsity Association, I think that would have been something that would have been pretty special to have when I was on campus, because we didn't have that. You, and like Homer said, you fit into sort of a category. You were, for me, it was a tennis player or you were just an athlete. And um, instead of having a group that you felt like you were extremely connected to, I think that could make a big difference. But I, I mean, I was also only there for two years, but I'd be interested to hear what the, um, the situation is today on campus, if it's, if it's very different than when I was there in the, in the late 90s. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not on campus now, so I can't speak to, to what the environment is like on campus today, but I, I, I came to campus at an interesting time where, you know, the summer before I arrived on campus, Michael Brown and Eric Garner were both killed. Um, and comparing just my perception of what campus looks like today in terms of, you know, for example, the existence of this organization that's holding this event and holding these conversations, or some of the conversations that were held during the summer by, by the varsity club that I was you know, fortunate to be a part of in comparison to kind of coming off the campus and always, and, you know, being immersed within the black community and, you know, seeing the strength within that community to rally around each other and to provide community and safe spaces to each other, but maybe not seeing at the same institutional level where these conversations were happening more broadly. I do think, you know, just from my external standpoint that there has been a shift in how the campus engages with these issues. Um, and that is expanding beyond just something that is exists with only only within the black community and becoming something that's more broad and more open on campus. Yeah, I mean, to add to that point, we did come, we arrived, I'm, I'm just a year younger than Chris, but arriving at kind of this start of the second like civil wave, uh, civil rights movement. Um, and the these events have, I think, given us kind of a platform and something to stand on to ensure that we do have support at the institutional level because you know these conversations are kind of always being had um you know like was mentioned on the back of you know the bus on the way to a sporting event or you know with close friends in the dorm room um but you always kind of have to be careful you know with who you're having this conversation with and how people are receiving it um and it's very easy for these type of conversations to become something that's polarizing like we've seen um so to have you know these events and have this shift in the the country's dialogue happen the way that it has it has you know laid the you know paved the way for organizations like this right um hbba to exist and support us and now we feel comfortable having these conversations on such a on a wide scale in front of such large audiences um and, and in that regard i think it's a, it's a really positive thing um but at the same time there there is still a lot of polarization happening and, and depending on where you are and who you're speaking to it, it these conversations can just, they can go a different way, right? Um, but I think that, you know, from my experience at Harvard, we were having these conversations. It was a little bit different and it wasn't, you know, supported on such a grand scale, but these conversations were being had. Um, I think moving forward that, you know, there's going to be a lot, a lot more conversation about it and a lot more support um, at an institutional level. And I guess one thing I just want to add on the back of what Gabby said, these conversations were being had. And I just want to give credit to, I know there's a lot of student organizers on campus, you know, both within the athletic community and without, you know, this wouldn't have happened without, you know, black students on campus consistently advocating for this, sometimes with, you know, the fruits of their labor being honored and other times with it, you know, feeling as if they were talking to a wall. So, you know, it's the continued work of students and community to drive this forward. And, you know, I hope that continues. And, I, you know, seeing Isaiah and Chelsea, you know, introduce us on this call, I think I think that spirit, you know, is definitely there. There is a theory that I have. Um, I've sort of shaped it over years and years of talking to a number of firsts. You know, first black person to do this, first black person to do that, et cetera. And it's the theory I call the super Negro theory, which is, the job of the super Negro is to come into a predominantly white environment and make them less racist, give them shelter from being racist, and whenever they fall short, particularly when it comes to athletics, to be the savior. We have a black person on our team now. Now we can win. Now we can compete. So I'm just curious as to being athletes on a predominantly white campus, um, some of you in, in, in predominantly white sports in general, did you feel an added burden to either be some sort of cover or to be some sort of whisperer for race relations? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that being in a predominantly white sport as well. Um, obviously, the, the road was paved with Althea Gibson, Arthur Ashe, Mal Washington, and then the Williams sisters even before. Well, and I'll admit before and after me, their careers are so long, which is incredible. But um, the... Um, there is that sense that um, you have to be a little bit better to get the same result. Um, and, you know, in, with that theory, the Jackie Robinson situation of you have to act, you can't act the way everyone else acts. You have to be better. 
Um, you have to turn the other cheek. You can't fight. You can't argue. You can't be in any, you can't give them any reason to tear you down. And at times I definitely felt that way because um, there are always people looking to tear you down. No matter, no matter what you look like, if you're at the top of the game or you're doing well, you're succeeding, you're, people are going to look to find a way to tear you down. But now if you're also standing out and, and you're doing well, then they're going to look for even, even they're going to scrutinize you even more to tear you down. So there was always that feeling of you have to be um, sort of that, I don't know, you have, you have to be that beacon. You have to be the one that's, that's standing tall and that is not giving them any extra reason to tear you down because they're always going to find a reason. And then when it comes to being the whisperer on race relations, yeah, I had even before all of these talks, the George Floyd talks back when I was at school in the late 90s, you have a lot of people that don't that haven't been around black people very often. They lived in a country club sort of lifestyle. They're around white people their whole lives. And so they're asking questions that should have been asked 10 years earlier um, in their communities to, to anyone else they're around. So it's, it's something where you do feel like you have to, you feel like there's a little bit of pressure that you have to give them a, a sense of um, their privilege and what they've lived and that it may not be normal to the rest of the world and what is normal to, to other communities. And that's, um, it is a little extra burden when you're trying to do something individually and you want to be um, so hyper-focused on what you're doing and being the best that you can be that you also feel like you have to be an educator. Um, but I also feel like that's, you know, that, that's sort of what you signed up for. That's part of the job. And if you want to give it the, the, the title of the super Negro theory. That's a, uh, I haven't heard that one, but it's a uh, special to, uh, I like the LD. But um, yeah, you do feel like there's that, that extra pressure, but I, I always felt like I, I enjoyed it when I felt like I got through, when I felt like I actually accomplished something because it also, with being that extra burden, I mean, you know, LZ that I'm, you know, I'll, I'll give credit to Billie Jean King that the pressure is a privilege. You know, you have the pressure of doing this, but then when you get through it and when you do something that you feel like you've succeeded in, whether it be in athletics or whether it be in educating, in educating um, you feel like you've accomplished something. So when I felt like I did something uh, athletically, I was proud, but when I felt like I educated a teammate um, or someone else that really didn't have any sense of, of anything in the black community. I felt like I, I hopefully can make a difference in a, in a very, very small way in those, uh, in those conversations. Oma, I saw you smiling when I was talking about the super Negro theory. What broke the smile? Uh, I think that just a lot of what James said resonated that uh, perhaps I, I will be fully honest, I was not necessarily the most um, standout player during my time on her uh, women's varsity soccer. So I don't know that I had the same type of pressures or expectations as someone who was, you know, at an all American level or, you know, competing for the Olympics, but I definitely felt uh, a sort of anxiety about being one of a few or, and I think in my case, the only uh, black person on a varsity squad, because all those questions that maybe went unanswered in people's backgrounds where they didn't have the opportunity to interact with people from different backgrounds. And it's not just, you know, soccer, it's just being part of a broader community that you wind up being the spokesperson. And in, in my case, I think that I never really felt as, uh, I would say, in my zone, because I definitely felt like I was living under a microscope, where perhaps my mistakes would be bigger or they would be more magnified because I was the only. Now, did I feel that for my teammates? I had a lot of great welcoming teammates, but I think that um, it's just a it's just a symptom of being one of a few or one of the only. Prior to coming to Harvard, you know, the sports I played were soccer, basketball, and crew. Crew is not known to be a very durable sport, especially in the late '80s, mid '90s in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I'd go down to the boathouse, and sometimes I get funny looks because people didn't know why. You know, where's this little black girl going? Like, oh, she's actually going to get a boat. But um, in in those moments, I think you develop sort of a resilience because you understand that you might be the only, but you also have to accept the fact that perhaps you have the opportunity, as James said, to have smaller conversations with people on a more personal level that might be longer lasting so that you're able to have those conversations early or have those conversations in a setting where maybe it's more impactful and that person will understand and that experience will resonate and that person's education or just ability to, to speak about these different topics is enhanced by the fact that you're able to sit down, break bread, and just have a conversation and talk about things. So Gabby, Chris, anything to add? 
Yeah, I guess, you know, uh, being on the basketball team, I think was, you know, was an interesting uh, experience, I think, in contrast to, you know, James and Coleman's experience, in the sense that, you know, we had, uh, you know, a majority black team with a black head coach. And I think in particular, Coach Emmerich did a really great job of cultivating a culture where uh, I don't think we felt the burden to start those conversations because he, he took it upon himself to start those conversations. Like we would find articles in our locker about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee when that was first when it when it first happened, and we sat down after practice and you know we discussed the article, and you know at being a black player on the team you feel very seen and I think environments like that where people you know create space for you to have discussions about things that are on your mind that on in a lot of you know you know you go around campus after you know a black person has been killed by the police or something has happened in the community. And it's as if it never happened in a lot of ways, right? You're expected to go to class just the same. You know, you're expected to turn in assignments on the same deadline, but you're dealing with trauma. So being able to have a space within the basketball team where one amongst your teammates, you know, you kind of have the rapport, we're able to talk about those things, but also having a coach who, you know, not only, you know, lets you talk about it, but makes it imperative and makes it a focus of his. I thought that was probably one of the most important parts of my Harvard experience. and you know, I think he definitely empowered us to find our voices in a lot of ways. So I thought that was, you know, a super special experience. Interestingly, I think that I had a similar experience. And one of the reasons I actually ended up choosing to run at Harvard was because of the, you know, Black student athlete community that I had found when visiting and doing my research. Um, so when I joined the Harvard track team, actually, you know, my, uh, my coach, my sprints coach, he was pretty new to Harvard and he was a black man and he kind of had turned this sprint program around where it was predominantly white um, just just before he got there. And he recruited me, you know, three, four years after he arrived. And there was just this group of really accomplished and uh, dedicated, motivated black women. And that's that's what brought me to Harvard, um, being able to be around you know, these women that I felt like I was comfortable having these conversations with. They were amazing role models. Um, and I, I just felt so comfortable going to practice every day, knowing that I didn't really have anything to prove. I didn't have to show them or, you know, explain these or teach them really anything about being a black student athlete and, you know, having to navigate this hybrid identity of being black and a student and an athlete, because we all kind of were sharing that same experience. And I got to look to them for guidance. Um, with that being said, I mean, I think that, there, you know, there are outside of the track world, um, outside of my track team, there were instances where I did almost feel like, you know, I had to prove myself because I, I am coming in and I'm, I'm this black girl that's very, you know, talented at track and field, you know, of course, and I'm going to Harvard and kind of, you know, the, the stereotypes and the, the thoughts about that, but, um, you know, inside my actual communities that I chose to immerse myself in, I, I had the, the fortune of just being very comfortable with that. Did you guys feel when you were student athletes that the athletic department was sensitive to the unique situations that you were in? I honestly, from my time back in the 90s, would have to say no. Uh, I don't think that it was necessarily something that was discussed with respect to making Black varsity athletes feel comfortable on campus. I personally was a walk-on, so I didn't go through the recruitment pipeline. So that might have been another place where I might have felt out of um, out of step with some of my um, some of my teammates who had gone through those sort of those steps. So. But I, I don't ever recall the coach at that time making space for black athletes. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm trying to think of about the, the sort of pivotal events that happened during my time there, but it's hard for me other than individual conversations I might have had with close friends I had on the soccer team who again were great people to spend time with and I really enjoyed the 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 special relationships that I built with those women, but I, I, it's hard for me to recall a time where I felt like there was a space carved out to talk to or address the needs of or identify opportunities to facilitate conversations among Black varsity athletes. Yeah, I would, I mean, I was there in the 90s as well, and I would, I would say the same thing. I, um, I had on the tennis team my brother when I was a freshman, he was a senior, and um, that helped, uh, that helped me 
to to get accustomed to lifestyle at Harvard and to to be a part of the team uh, with him. But I really can't say that I had um, a direct ally in the in the athletic department. Um, I, I can't say I was outspoken to go and and start it myself either. So you know, part of that's on me. Um, but had there been a BVA back then, um, I, I like to think I would have maybe had more of a voice. I would have felt a little more empowered and, and been able to, um, you know, just feel a little more um, a part of something special like this. Because like I said, Harvard's intimidating. You come in there and almost everyone on campus was was the big man or big woman on campus when they came from high school or wherever they came from. So um, it, it, it's it's a situation where it's not as, it, for me at least, I got, I got to school and I was 17 years old and it was it was a bit intimidating for me to speak up at that time. Um, I didn't feel like I had that voice quite yet. Um, Chris and Gabby, I'm, yeah. I'm curious as to if you had a, you know, sticky note that you can write down two suggestions for the athletic department to help the students after you, what would you write on those notes and, and hand to, you know, the magician who will instantly make these changes? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, at first, I, I do appreciate the kind of holistic approach that the, you know, all of Harvard gives us as Black student athletes, which is, you know, not really isolating us as, you know, Black student athletes and letting us, you know, be amongst kind of everyone and not feeling too different. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think there's something to be said because it, it's a very unique experience to not just be a student athlete, but to be a Black one, not just to be, um, yeah, so I mean, I think that um, an organization like HBBA is an amazing first step, right? So this is already going in, in a great direction. Um, and then going forward there, I mean, I think just having specifically tailored resources for specifically, you know, Black student athlete issues, um, because, you know- like, 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 give us an example. Yeah, um, I think, there, you know, it can be, it, being at Harvard uh, specifically, it, it, it is very difficult to not just one, be a student athlete and you're, you're experiencing kind of a different version of Harvard than all of your other peers. Um, like for instance, you, you don't have time to do a lot of things that they are able to do. And there's really nobody, <laughs> not many people who actually can be understanding of what that looks like, right? So you, you can speak to professors, you can speak to, I, I don't even know if I really felt like I had a mentor available to help me navigate those kinds of conversations. Um, and I, I ended up feeling very anxious and overwhelmed a majority of the time. And I, I would use my, my coach kind of as that, that resource. Um, but obviously, you know, your, your coach is not a, it's not a great mentor liaison for that specific issue because they, they can't really, you know, relate to that either. They're not in your shoes. Um, so maybe a specific role, you know, where someone can actually help you navigate those, those situations, those, those conversations and just those feelings, right? Just some, like an outlet to have um, where, you know, yeah, because it, it's just a very unique feeling of stress and overwhelming um, so that, that's what I would, I would recommend that. If I could go back in time, I, I would have really appreciated that, that type of outlet. Chris? Yeah, I think I, I'd echo what Gabby, and Gabby just, you know, spoke to. I think having, you know, particularly on campus more broadly, a more mental health resources dedicated to, to the Black population, but specifically, you know, being able to have mental resources, mental health resources that are able to help Black student athletes or, you know, fall within that category in some, in some sense would be super helpful because you're one, you're dealing with, you know, entering into this predominantly white institution. You know, we all hear about imposter syndrome and the effects that that can have. I remember, you know, coming into Harvard, uh, I didn't think I was that smart, you know, relative to the rest of my classmates, even though I had, you know, done really well in high school, ended up doing well at Harvard. But I remember freshman year, just feeling almost hopeless. How can I can, you know, how can I even, be amongst these people. I'm just a basketball player and, you know, I'm just a black guy, right? And all these different, you know, the intersectionality of those two identities can be very tough from just an identity perspective. And then when you layer on the idea of, you know, being, you know, being an athlete and, and the, the pressures that come with that, where, you know, for me, I formed my identity in high school around being a basketball player, you know, is what I did, is what I wanted to do professionally. 
And then coming into Harvard, and where you know a lot of in coming into college more broadly, where a lot of student athletes realize, you know, you're not the star of the team. You're the freshman. You have to learn how to, you know, you have to, you know, find, find out what TA wants you to do to get on the court. And just dealing with, you know, all these different mismatches of issues, I think from a mental health perspective can be particularly draining. So having some type of liaison from that perspective would be super helpful. And I think the second would be, um, and this is, you know, this speaks more to, you know, experiences I've heard from friends who are on, you know, teams that were perhaps less, uh, less diverse, having some type of training for coaches to be able to, you know, um, understand issues of diversity and understand and be more empathetic, you know, when, when certain things happen and, you know, help students navigate, help the culture of a team navigate different, different issues because you might not be a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, conversation with your coach, but, you know, I've, I've, I've had friends, you know, who, who, who played, you know, sports at Harvard and, you know, when Trayvon Martin is happening, they have to see their teammates saying certain things, right? And, I can only imagine what your, you know, your family on campus and seeing, you know, those different things happen, how that one impacts your experience as a black student athlete, but also just as a person, you know, 19 year old, 17 year old, you know, away from, from your family for the first time. I know that we are getting close to um, JB having to duck out um, and do his day job or is it your night job? Cause it's Australia, I can't remember. But um, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to share any other uh, parting thoughts before um, you, know, you have to go. Well, yeah, thank you for, for having me. I'm sorry I'm gonna miss the, the Q&A. Those are always uh, really interesting to hear what, the, what the, the other questions are that maybe we haven't thought of or we haven't thought to answer. But um, for me, I, I appreciate you guys being here. Um, uh, it brings me back to my days of, uh, a feeling uh, very special to be part of the community, to be part of the Harvard community and, and this this community, especially Gabby, Chris, Coma, you guys are, are doing amazing work and it's uh, it's impressive just to be here. Um, LZ, you do okay too. So uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. And I, you know, I, I absolutely love what you guys are doing. And as, as I think we've all um, at some point touched on uh, today is that we want to continue the momentum and things do seem to be going in the right direction. And as Chris, I think said uh, very appropriately early is that we, we, we don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose that momentum and we don't want to have people stop doing the work um, that goes into to making the society a better place, to making the Harvard community a better place, to make the Black Marcy Association a better uh, place for athletes. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this. I'm proud to, to be on this panel and, and thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, I gotta, uh, I gotta go pay some bills. So <laughs> um, thanks for having me guys. Thanks, JB. So um, we have a couple more minutes together um, with this discussion. I wanted to remind the participants who are watching that if they have any questions to use the Q&A function on the bottom screen of uh, the little Zoom chat we're having here to submit those, and we'll try to get as many of those questions as possible. Um, I do have one question here. Um, I think it's really interesting. Do you think there's anything we can do with our team or athletics at large to have an impact that goes beyond superficial or performing of changes? So what can a sports team or the athletic departments do in general that's beyond saying, hey, did you guys know about Juneteenth? Like something with a little bit more, more teeth, if you will. I mean, one thing I've always found and I've learned through, you know, some of the work I've done is, is the power of understanding the Harvard platform and understanding that it, it isn't necessarily your voice that matters, right? The, the voice of the community is what matters and being able to, I think, build more connectivity between maybe Harvard athletics and the surrounding communities, I think would be, I think would be a great way to create change because that's something that would last, you know, being able to build connectivity between Harvard's campus and you know, organizations in the Boston community that are working towards change. Um, you know, and this was something that I, I was able to see, you know, firsthand uh, with some of the work we did with No More Names. We, we arrived at Yale's campus after there had been a police shooting. Um, and we were able to see Yale students side by side with residents of New Haven organizing, protesting. And, you know, when I check in with, you know, the students who were organizing that, they're still working hand in hand with the community. So being able to see, you know, build those kind of institutional ties where 
we're allowing community organizations to leverage the Harvard brand, leverage the Harvard network. I think that's something where we can really take what Harvard has that is special and the Harvard, what the Harvard Athletic Department has that is special and you know, use that towards continuous lasting good. I would also add to that that you know, there, there's also a role perhaps for friends communities to be able to play with that because we all have a commonality. We all love the sport that we played at Harvard. I am sort of a dual citizen because I am a member of the Harvard Women's Soccer Friends Community. I'm the chair of the women's, uh, the varsity women's rugby community. And when when you know George Floyd is murdered and you know the, the to your point, too many names. We had a conversation, we held space within our friends community because perhaps it could be a little bit easier to facilitate those conversations when you have, you're starting from a commonality. We all were part of a rugby program, whether it was club or varsity. We all have a love for sport. We all have a love for athletics and what, what role that played in our lives. And perhaps there's an opportunity to facilitate more of those conversations when you already have a community within a community where you have that, that base level commonality where you can build off being teammates across decades to be able to facilitate and, and keep those conversations moving because when the conversation stops then, then we're all in a lot of trouble and I think that starting from a base of perhaps commonality and understanding from across the decades within constituent communities within the athletic community is a good first start. Agreed and I think you know touching on what Chris said before um, Harvard does have a very special platform um, within itself. And I think there's so much that we can do just within, you know, the Boston community itself. Um, I worked at this foundation one summer, the Hyams Foundation. It does a lot for the Boston community, um, particularly under resource communities. Um, and, and so if we can just put these efforts that we're putting it, you know, into, into panels like this and having these conversations over and over again, and kind of deciding when do these conversations actually become, you know, tangible action and actual tangible plans. And what are these, um, what are the actual, you know, university wide uh, anti-racism initiatives that are, that are happening? Where, where can we actually see them? Um, additionally, I think relying a little bit less on, you know, black people to be having the conversations and leading them. I think because as we touched on before earlier in the panel, that is a lot of stress and, and it's a lot of load to have on us to, to rely on us to be holding people accountable and holding ourselves accountable um, to have these, these initiatives, right? Um, so I'd love to just see more, more white people taking the lead, <laughs> you know, on these, on these conversations and, and, and these organizations. So that's what I would it was funny you were bringing this up. One of the questions that came through um, from one of the viewers was about an organization um, he started. His name is James, I believe it's DeBello. I apologize if I mispronounced it. Um, he was a, a defensive end for, for Harvard, graduated in 80. He's white. And he, along with a, a friend uh, who happened to be black, put together Athletes Race Talk, art, which was created strictly to have these sort of uncomfortable conversations, especially for white athletes who um, may be encountering black people for the first time and have all these questions. Um, do you think something like an art, or I guess heart, if it was at Harvard, um, would be a benefit um, to not just the white students, but also black students who are trying to feel seen? I definitely think so. I mean, it's something that I would love to learn more about because um, anytime you can facilitate conversations, you're going to get something out of it, both parties. And I think that you know, to your point, we were talking about sort of that, that magical athletic Negro that is supposed to harmonize and outperform. I mean, I, I quite frankly started being tired of everybody's black friend because it gets tough when people are asking you, you sort of the Venn diagram of, you know, people in different circles of black friend, and then that's you. So you're having these conversations over and over again while you're trying to process the burden of what you're seeing, what you're feeling, and, and how do you hold it all together when you're trying to, in some cases, go to practice or go to work and do what, you're, what, you're, what you need to get done. So I think that anywhere that we could have those conversations in a facilitated environment where people feel like they can actually be their authentic selves and have these discussions, the only thing that can come from it is hopefully mutual understanding and growth because all of us have unconscious biases that we come to the table with. If we don't confront, look at them, examine them and move past them, then we're just talking past each other and we're not growing as people and we're not 
not deepening our understanding and our empathy towards other cultures, other races, other lived experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it. I would love to hear more about art as well, especially at a place like Harvard. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many times that people have told me that they really did not interact with black people before coming to Harvard or doing a sport at Harvard. And for me, it's mind blowing, but no, that's an actual reality. Um, and, you know, something that I did or I was fortunate enough to do was I, you know, I was tired of also being, you know, the black friend. Um, so I found communities and navigated towards communities where I didn't have to be that and I didn't have to fill that space. And I was fortunate to have that just, you know, coming into Harvard when I did and, and being on the track team when I was. Um, but I, I think it's also easy, you know, it, or it's actually difficult uh, for white people to remain engaged and remain, you know, encouraged to be engaged when they're not having to actively be in the conversations. You know, listening to panels is one thing, but actively being a part of it is another. Um, and, you know, sitting in on an AFIM class and talking in section is one thing, but, you know, actively having to be a part of these really, really critical and uncomfortable conversations is, is a different ball game. So I think, I think art sounds like it would, I would definitely welcome that at Harvard. I think it's a great idea. Um, Chris. Yeah, I guess not to belabor the point, you know, I could, would love to hear more. I think it would be, you know, a powerful initiative potentially. Um, you know, when you, when you think about the, the, the idea of oppression and what it means to be oppressed, you know, that, that's an action happening to you, right? And that doesn't mean it's your duty for the oppression to end because that, that act is being carried out by an oppressor, right? So it's the duty of, you know, the people, of, of groups of people who are, you know, beneficiaries of the oppression to, to do the work because at the end of the day, it's going to be their decision and you know a process that happens within their community to end you know kind of those processes so i think uh any or any initiative that enables those conversations to happen where the burden is lifted off you know the shoulders of the oppressed to to to, to end that i think is important and significant um we have a question here uh, my daughter will be playing at harvard on the women's tennis team in september and i was wondering what can she do to get involved with the community of at harvard uh as an african-american so basically if you can go back in time to your younger selves and offer yourself advice or direction in terms of surviving this campus and this experience what would be that advice what could this young woman take from you that would help her during her journey? I would say first and foremost, you're there because you deserve to be there. Don't let anybody else make you feel like you're not supposed to be there, that something special happened for you to arrive. No, you're sitting on the campus, you remember that class because you deserve to be a part of that community, full stop. So whatever that, you know, that your daughter is feeling down or feeling any imposter syndrome, let's go back to that. You earned your spot, you deserve to be there. So. I think also with, with the, the Black Pharmacy Association, what an amazing resource to draw from, because whether it's trying to figure out what classes you should take, which professors have the toughest sections, um, you know, what do you think of this concentration versus that concentration, what an amazing resource of people who share a lived experience similar to yours to be able to lean on. So those are the things, quite frankly, if I had that at Harvard, I think I would have been less anxious, more comfortable in myself, more comfortable in my athletic self. Um, but I would just offer those two pieces of advice that you're there because you're supposed to be. You, that's your spot. You earn it, own it, and, and just run with it. And if you have a community of people like the BVA that you can draw from and whose, whose knowledge and help you can, you can draw from while you're there, just do it. Because it, it, it takes a lot to get through an institution like Harvard and resources like that will be invaluable. Just get there on day one knowing you're supposed to be in that spot and there's people who are there to support you and lift you up. I think one thing that, you know, I would have told myself is, you know, I was 17 years old, scared, nervous, uh, unsure of myself. I wish I just knew that literally everyone was, right? And it's so easy to look around and be like, I'm at Harvard, everybody's confident, everybody knows what they're doing. We're all, we're 17, like your freshman class, you guys are all kids, like you guys, no, nobody has a clue what's going on. And like, just understanding that, you know, there might be, you know, a few whiz kids in your class who are, you know, further along, but um, understanding that everybody's just trying to figure things out and understanding that and putting yourself out there because you'll be surprised when you put yourself out there that someone else will see, oh, 
you know, you're like me and, you know, you'll be able to form connections by being your true self early on rather than, you know, necessarily trying to fit in. Um, so that's the one thing I wish I knew. Yeah, I guess one thing I would tell myself is, you know, to be just very, very open to different types of communities. And there's, Harvard's such a special place that there's so much that you can learn from everyone. And that's just, that's not even just at Harvard, but you know, there's across the board at any university, there are so many different people coming in with so many different experiences. Um, so, I mean, just to re re reiterate what they said, if you just go in and, and you're, you know, feeling confident in who you are and that you belong and, and uh, you find your place and you'll find your place in the community. And along the way also just learn so much from everyone else around you from different communities, whether that's the student athletes on you, you know, the tennis team or other African-American students, or I don't know, <laughs> a random white student who's interested, you know, pre-law, right? There's so much that you can learn from people um, at Harvard and, and you, can, you can find your place in the community. I wanna make sure we wrap, I make sure we end this on a high note. So, I want to ask each of you to identify an athlete that you found particularly inspirational and to share with the, the participants why. And let's start with Coma. <laughs> because you have such a unique path. I mean, rugby, <laughs> soccer. Like, who did you look up to? Yeah, I, my, my parents couldn't keep track of me because I was always running off somewhere chasing a ball that was round or oblong or something like that, or sometimes an orc. Um, I think for me, there's there are a few athletes I looked up to. I mean, at the time, she wasn't that far away from me, but um, Brianna Scurry, who was playing, uh, she was a goalkeeper, she was at UMass, and eventually was on the U.S. Women's National Team, and um, just an incredible, tenacious athlete, and you know, playing the position that, quite frankly, there's not a lot of Black goalkeepers um, but she was an, an excellent one and gave so much to the sport and probably paved the way for a lot of little black girls who wanted to get in the net. Um, other athletes that I probably think about uh, on a semi-regular basis, some of them may not be known to a lot of folks. Uh, I look at somebody who's a, an English um, rugby player. Her name is Maggie Alfonsi. She is one of the best flankers to have ever played the game. And she is an advocate for black women in rugby. And I also look up to her because there are a lot of things that she is doing just by being visible and present that make it easier for other people of color to be involved with, get involved with and feel connected to uh, rugby. So those are two athletes just off the top of my head who were, I'd say important people with respect to the sports that I played because they showed me a lot of ways where it could be amazing to be a black female athlete in a sport that doesn't have a lot of black female athletes. I mean, an athlete I always looked up to, and uh, I would say uh, Kobe Bryant, you know, rest his soul in peace, uh, was always a, a role model of mine, just in his tenacity as an athlete, but also and kind of his breadth as a person, you know, he's multifaceted. A lot of people don't know, like he grew up in Italy, you know, spoke multiple, spoke multiple languages, uh, you know, after his career, started won an Oscar from, you know, a short film that he made, penned a poem in the Players' Tribune. Um, so yes, you know, his ability to show that there's more to him than just his sport um, and that he was a multifaceted man. And then also just, I, I truly appreciated, um, you know, the whole girl dad phenomenon, but, um, the idea that, you know, a lot of people would come up to Kobe and say stuff like, oh, are you, aren't you mad you didn't have a son? And like just his ability to just point out how ridiculous something like that was. And, you know, his ability to stand on that. And um, I thought that was super important uh, and an important dialogue that he started and the way he loved his the way he loved his girls. I thought that was super special. Something I always really appreciated. So, um, I, I, yeah, so that's my guy. Um, for me, uh, two people come to mind. Um, first is Meredith Rainey, who uh, ran at Harvard. She was an 800-meter runner, um, and I believe she was the first Black woman in the Ivy League to win an NCAA championship, and then she went on to be a two-time Olympian, um, which was just very inspiring for me to see. Um, you know, that, that type of thing just doesn't come very often, <laughs> coming from um, an athletics department like Harvard. It's just people are focused on other things. Um, to see her succeed so much, um, as a black woman was just, it's very uplifting for me. And I definitely aspire to do that. And then secondly was just my teammate who was a senior when I was a freshman, her name's Autumn Franklin. And she taught me everything I know right now about being a professional athlete um, or just about being 
a great athlete and, and going after what I want. It was from the little things of, you know, actually cooling down and doing my stretching after a workout to the big things like, you know, how to push yourself um, with nutrition and your lifestyle choices and the actual workouts. So, it, you know, if not for her, I just, I don't think I would be where I am right now. And she just made such an impact on me. And I was able to see her every day. So to have that kind of inspiration right in front of me, um, it was, it was everything to me. That is fantastic. You know, one of the reasons why I love participating in panels, whether as a panelist myself or, or moderator, it's because I get to learn. And I've learned so much from each of you. I didn't learn anything from James. I've known him for a long time. I knew everything he had to say. But from the other three, from you guys, um, so inspiring, so much wisdom. I really hope that those who are, are watching uh, were, able, were able to get some things. Sounds like this art or heart idea um, was a winner amongst you. So maybe Aaron or, or someone else will, will take that on. But I just really appreciate you guys being so open and honest and just sharing your, your truth and your experiences. Um, they're absolutely invaluable. So, so thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, back to Isaiah and Chelsea. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, LZ. Wow. Thank you to uh, all the panelists, um, Chris, Coma, Gabby, um, James. Um, this was just spectacular. Um, obviously, your guys' resume speaks for yourselves, um, but everything that you guys have been able to do, um, what, you know, during your times at Harvard um, and after, uh, and then still have the time to come back and speak, uh, you know, for this event. Um, it means a lot uh, for for you know somebody still at Harvard um, to know that we have alum like y'all um, that are still you know putting in that work to make sure um, you know that the future is bright for us. Um, LZ, I know you are you're super busy, um, so to have you on this event means means a lot. Um, so thank you so much uh, to Aaron uh, and the uh, athletic department. Uh, as well as the Harvard City Club. Thank you all for helping facilitate this event um, and, you know, um, and then um, asking great questions and, um, you know, caring enough to be here and, and participate. Thank you so much. Um, Chelsea, you can, you can add anything you'd like uh, and yeah. Well, yeah, I just want to thank you guys for an engaging conversation. It was very helpful and hopefully um, the students at Harvard and and incoming students will have a lot to um, look up to and a lot of words of wisdom. But I just want to thank you guys for coming and having a great rest of your e evening. So thank you. Yes. And uh, just one, just one last thing. Um, we we definitely did. Uh, you know, for for the the young tennis player that's coming in. Um, you know, whatever you know issues that that, that you think you might have, HABVA um, is is built for for especially. Um, young freshmen coming in, not knowing exactly how to navigate um, Harvard. So if they're, you know, if you have any concerns or really anything, um, as far as getting involved with the black community, getting involved with Harvard, understanding classes, understanding how to navigate um, an Ivy League institution as a black athlete, um, please join our group. We will be there for you. We will make sure that you have the support that you need. Um, there are also a lot of alumni here um, uh, as, as Participants watching this event, um, we, we do have an alum, an alumni mentoring. Uh, so you can get involved with a mentoring program where you young uh, Harvard student athletes. Um, so again, thank you all. We're just getting started, um, and we really, really appreciate the panelists, um, and, you know, the athletic department, um, LZ, everybody. Thank you so much for this this amazing event. We really appreciate it. All right.